Hello and welcome to the Horns and Whistles Workshop YouTube channel. My name's Mark. Uh, thank you for joining me on this video. This video is a installation tutorial for my Lima Ringfield motor upgrade kits. And what I'm going to do is fit one of those kits to this Lima Class 47 that I recently purchased uh, on eBay. I'm also going to give the model a bit of a clean and a service during that installation. Uh, and I'll show you how I do all of that as well. So the Lima Ringfield motor upgrade kit, uh, which is available on eBay, and you may have already seen that, and the, the link to this video may have been from that eBay listing, consists of uh, a CD drive motor inside a 3D printed plastic fitting adapter. Let's move this out of the way for a moment. Uh, a length of heat shrink tubing and two little pinion gears um, you only need to use one of them, however I give you two so that you have a spare because what we need to do during the installation process is cut this gear in half and there's a possibility that that gear might either break or, or ping off. Hopefully it won't, if done properly it should work absolutely fine. So let's just put that to one side and I'm just going to go through the tools that you're going to need to do this job. It's not very many to be fair, so you're going to need a craft knife. Um, it doesn't have to be particularly heavy duty, as you can see this is a small lightweight one, but it does need to be quite a sharp one. So if it's an old blunt knife, I wouldn't use it. It does need to be a nice sharp blade. You're going to need just a couple of small screwdrivers, uh, a flathead and a, uh, a Phillips or a crosshead screwdriver. You're going to need some solder and a soldering iron, of which mine is plugged in on the shelf above my head. Um, it would be handy to have a pair of wire strippers. Uh, if you have a pair, if not, you can use a, a craft blade or some wire cutters or even your fingernails or teeth just to strip back the wire. So that's what you need for fitting the kit. And for servicing the model, I use uh, lighter fluid. A lot of people use isopropyl alcohol, any sort of spirit based fluid will do. I also suggest you have a couple of cotton buds and an oil dropper. I'll put a link to all of those uh, tools that you might not have readily available in the video description. So if you need to go and buy some, you can go and do so. So let's move my tools and bits to one side. Now the first thing I'm gonna do before I actually do anything with the model is deal with this pinion gear. So this gear needs to slide onto that shaft, but these gears are reasonably wide. That's probably about six mil wide, and that's actually far too wide to fit into the motor chassis that comes on the Lima model. So what you need to do is cut this gear in half. Now you'll see, hopefully it shows up on the video, one side of the gear, so it's this side of the gear, has got a bit of a chamfer. So there's no teeth up to the edge of the gear. And this other side of the gear here has got teeth right up to the edge. Now what we wanna do is cut this in half and preferably we're gonna take the half that has teeth right up to the edge and put that on the shaft of our motor. Now cutting this gear in half is what you need your craft knife for. Now, when you do this, I would suggest you don't just put your gear down, put your knife on and press down because you won't get a straight clean cut. What you want to do first is score the gear all the way round, which is quite easy to do. And then once you've scored the gear where you want to cut it, you can then press down and you should get a nice clean cut that should be relatively straight. It might not be exactly straight. You don't need to lose any sleep over that. As long as it's reasonably straight and even, you'll be absolutely fine. So what I'm going to do is put my blade in the middle of the gear. So the gear is on the mat so such that I can roll it. So it's on its round uh, edge, if you like, on the mat. So I put my blade onto the gear at one extreme end of the blade and make sure the blade is at 90 degrees to the teeth of the gear, just like that. And what I'm gonna do is put a little bit of downward pressure and just using my other hand to encourage the gear to roll in a straight line, I'm just gonna roll the gear underneath the blade pressing down on the blade so that I'm scoring the gear all the way round. I'm just gonna keep going round and round. See, I'm halfway down the blade now. Keep going round and round 
putting some downward pressure on that blade, scoring that gear until I get pretty much to the end of my cutting blade. Now, if you take your knife away from your gear, I don't know if it will show up on the video, but you can look at your gear and you'll be able to see a score line in the middle. So now to cut the gear in half, just put your blade onto that score line, like so, and then just holding the gear with your thumb and forefinger with your blade through it so you're not going to cut your finger. You want to make sure that you hold the gear a little bit, otherwise when you cut it might ping off and you might lose it. Just press down and your gear is cut in half. And as you can see there, that has actually cut really evenly. That's a nice, even shaped gear. So that's what I need. The other bit can be discarded. Uh, and as I say, I give you two, because if that does go wrong and you end up breaking the gear or the gear pings off and you can't find it, you've got a spare, but it's not particularly tricky to do. Now I'm just going to slide that gear onto the shaft of the motor. It's a tight fit, so give it a push. And then use your thumb and four fingers on the bottom just to lower that gear down. And you want to lower that towards sort of the base of the shaft, but you want to keep a gap. So if I bring my knife back, you have a gap just between the bottom of the gear and the motor. I'm gonna keep that gap there, roughly a millimeter, but we might need to adjust it a bit later when we fit it to the model. So that's that bit dealt with. So I'm gonna put that motor to one side now and bring in the model, because what we're gonna do is take the model apart, strip the original motor out, give the model a good clean, and then install the new motor. Now this is a Lima Class 47. As I say, I bought it on eBay. Um, I don't know whether it runs or not. I've never tried to run it. I've never taken it apart. I've no idea what it's going to look like inside. It looks a bit dirty. It certainly could do with a clean. Um, it could probably do with a re-lubrication as well. So we'll do that. Now, one thing with Lima models is quite often they have a screw securing the body to the chassis. And that screw would sometimes be maybe around there or around there. Let's turn some lights on. Uh, around there or there. So before you go trying to unclip the body and pull it off, just have a check around and make sure, and it's worth checking down in the top as well, make sure there's no discrete screws that are gonna prevent that body from coming away because the last thing you wanna do is try and yank something and it break. Uh, and what I need to do with this model is remove the buffers because the buffers actually go through the body and into the chassis. So I just need to, with my thumb and forefinger, pull those buffers out. There and there. Uh, and one thing I've also got is just a little pot or a tray in the pot over there. I always find it handy to have a pot or a tray so that when you take things apart, you can put some, them in something where they're not gonna roll away and get lost. So, uh, And then unclip the body just by running your fingernail or thumbnail along the side to undo the clips. And you can see, if you have a look at the body of the chassis, sorry, it's got three holes here, one there, one there, one there, and it's the same on the other side, a hole there, a hole there, and a hole in the middle. And if you have a look on the inside of the body, there are six clips, three on each side that correspond to those holes. So effectively, all you're doing to take that body off is opening the body up slightly to release those clips to take the body away. Um, and here we have the chassis. So I'm going to take that weight out as well and put that over by the body. Uh, and what I need to do is just disconnect this wire from the motor so that I can remove the motor bogey. Now, before I do that, I'll just explain how these models work. Because if I explain that now, it might make it easier to understand how you wire up the motor, the new motor when you fit it. So these models, much like Hornby models, have pickups at each end. So this is your dummy bogey at this end. And this is your motor bogey at this end. Now, if you have a look at your motor bogey, you will see that on one side, which is the same side that the gears are on, there are rubber tires, we call them traction tires, on the wheels. 
and they are on the wheels that have gear, black gears molded into the back of the wheel. And so those traction tires are effectively what give you your drive, but of course, because there's rubber on those wheels, they don't pick up any electricity from the rail. So the electricity from the rail at the motor bogey end is picked up by these wheels here. So if we have it on a fictional rail with the front, the motor being the front and the direction of travel being that way, you can see that what is effectively the left-hand rail or the rail closest to the camera are the wheels that pick up the power from that rail because the right-hand rail, those wheels have got rubber tires. So the wheels on the motor bogey pick up power from the left-hand rail and they feed that power through uh, a little wire here and conduct it into that strip there behind which is a spring and a carbon brush. The other rail conducts power through the back here, through the dummy bogey. So that is the right-hand rail if we're traveling in that direction. So if we turn it over, you can't notice or really tell, there's no difference between the wheels, but I know, uh, and you can tell because the traction tires on the front are on that side, that these wheels down here, so the ones at the bottom, as you look at it now, the right-hand rail, uh, pick up power from the right-hand rail, from the dummy bogey, conduct it through uh, a brass pickup into this clip, through this wire, onto the other brass pickup or conductive strip on the motor behind which is another spring and carbon brush. So you have effectively a positive and a negative. One of the rails is your positive, one is the negative, and you can reverse that polarity to reverse the direction of travel of the motor. So when we fit our new motor, where we have two wires here coming out of the motor, a red and a black, what we're gonna need to do is connect one of those wires to this bogey via this wire. And the other one of those wires connects to the motor bogey. Now, we're probably not gonna use this wire to connect to our new motor, probably gonna remove that wire entirely and then connect the wire on the new motor directly to the chassis. And I'll show you how to do that. But the first thing we're gonna do is just disconnect this wire here that goes to the dummy bogey so that I can release the motor housing from the chassis. So if I Move that out of the way there. Now to release the motor housing from the chassis, the best way to do it is just turn the motor so it's at an angle, and then you do need to just bend and stretch the chassis a little bit until it pops through. Now they're quite bendy and stretchy, these chassis, but do be careful because ultimately, if you bend and stretch it too much or too quickly, you're gonna break it, and, and that's obviously no good at all. So there we have our uh, motor. Now, looking at it, it is a bit dirty. So before I fit the new motor, I'm just gonna apply some power to this original motor here to get the wheels turning so that I can give them a bit of a clean. So all I've got is my uh, standard Hornby analog controller and some crocodile clips. Be interesting to see if this works actually because I don't know whether this motor actually runs so I'll attach my crocodile clips to the um, motor here and turn the controller on it just about moves okay so switch that off for a minute what I'm going to do is get a cotton bud and put a bit of your cleaning fluid of choice on the end of the cotton bud. Get the motor running and the wheels turning and then just press that cotton bud onto your wheels to give them a clean. Now you can see how dirty that cotton bud's got. Now I wouldn't use any cotton bud that's got any solvent based fluid on it on the rubber tires. I'll just use a dry cotton bud to clean them. do this one in the middle by hand and then at the other end my dry cotton bud I'm just going to rub those tyres because there's all sorts of fluff and oil and grime on them but as I say you don't want to use any solvent based fluid on those rubber tyres because you could cause them to, to perish 
Look how dirty that is. That's really dirty. That's one thing people often forget when you're running a model railway is people are often in the habit of cleaning their track, which is good. But what people often forget is that your wheels on your model are often just as dirty as your track is. Uh, and so actually regularly cleaning your wheels is as important, I think, as cleaning a track. So anyway, that's that done. Now, this wire here that goes to this terminal here, you can trace that down to a tiny little clip just under there. Uh, it's a bit tricky to get to. Hopefully you can see it on the uh, video. Uh, so what we're gonna do is disconnect that wire from that clip just there because I'm gonna solder my new motor wire directly to that clip rather than stripping the wire. So, solder that there, disconnect that. Oh, my light's flashing above my head. So that is that disconnected. So now what I can do is remove the original motor. So this has got uh, flathead screws. There's two screws, one there, one there. So let's undo those screws and take the motor off. Uh, you need to keep these screws because you need to reuse them to fit your new motor. So I'm going to pop them in my pot over there. And here, oh, it fell away. You can see the uh, the springs that are on the other side of those brass strips. They then conduct power into that carbon brush, which presses onto this armature here, which when you have two, create your... Um, polarity that makes it spin a bit like a worse than an electromagnet really so that armature needs to come out thumb and forefinger pull it out now you can keep all these bits because ultimately this entire job of fitting this new motor is completely reversible so if you decide one day to sell your model but you want to keep your new upgraded motor and put it on a different model if you keep all of your bits that you remove you can just refit your motor because we don't need to make any changes whatsoever to the to the chassis, to the body of it at all. Now to remove the magnet, there's a, a, a little clip there that you need to release just by pushing down. Now that, it sometimes is a bit tricky to be fair. So if you can get a screwdriver in there to release that, there you go, and then it comes out. That is, can be a little bit tricky. Uh, now this looks reasonably clean in there, but I am just gonna get a little wipe, just a little rag, put a bit of cleaning fluid on that rag. I'm just gonna give that a bit of a clean in there and give the gears a little bit of a wipe as well, because things just tend to run a bit more smoothly when they're clean. There we go. Uh, and while I've got it apart, I'm just going to use my oil dropper here and just put a tiny, tiny bit of oil on these gears. Now, less is more when it comes to oil. You don't want to over oil. You don't want dry gears, but you certainly don't want to over oil because it will get really mucky really quickly. So just where the gear sits over its axle or the gear is held on by these tiny little bolts, just a tiny drop of oil, give it a spin with your finger to get it spread around a little bit and that is more than enough to keep that running smoothly. So now what I'm gonna do is fit the new motor and it is as simple as this. So take your motor, wires facing upwards and slide it in to your chassis. That's pretty much it. Now, what you do need to do is have a look down here. Can I bring my light a bit closer? You might be able to see. In fact, one way to demonstrate it is if I spin this gear, now it is just about catching. What I said earlier about when you fit your pinion gear, your little nylon gear to the shaft of the motor, you might need to adjust it because if you have a look, there's a tiny little gap here where you can see the white gear on the new motor and you can see how well it's engaging with these pancake gears on the model. And I can see that although it's just about engaging and I can tell it's engaging because if I spin one gear on one side, the other on the other side turns, 
it hasn't got that much purchase and I need to move that gear. And what I need to do is move it further up this shaft. So all I'm gonna do is put my screwdriver in that gap that's between the gear and the motor and just rotate my screwdriver very, very gently and slightly. And I'm just giving myself, all it is is an extra half a mil, maybe slightly more than that. And then refit the gear, uh, the motor into the model and check again how well that gear engages. Have a look. I might even move that up a little bit more, to be fair. Because the last thing you want to do is get it all fitted and reassembled and find that you, you, you get some sort of slippage where the gear is not fully engaging. There we go. So that white nylon gear is really hard to see on the video. Hopefully when you do it yourself, you'll be able to see what I'm trying to explain. That white nylon gear that I fitted to my new motor is now fully engaged and has got a good purchase on those gears that are fitted to the chassis. So now the motor's in place, uh, you can see on the other side, you've got your tabs here with your screw holes that coincide with the screw holes on the chassis. Just gonna make sure they're lined up and then bring my screws back that I took off. Pop the screw in there and tighten that up. Uh, and then my other screw goes in that side. I didn't fully tighten the first one, just left it a little bit loose just to make sure I could line up the second one. So I'm gonna go back and just tighten that. They don't need to be particularly tight, bearing in mind you're screwing into a plastic thread. So if you over tighten it, you will split that or strip that thread. So just thumb and forefinger tight is absolutely fine. And so there we have the motor physically fitted into the chassis. And now what I need to do is connect it up electrically. So I'm gonna use my black wire here and I'm going to connect it to that little tab that's hidden behind that wheel there. So with a bit of solder, and my soldering iron, I'm just going to tin that black wire. And I'm also going to tin the tab here. I'll be very careful because obviously you've got all the plastic body nearby, you don't want to be damaging any of that, melting any of that, and then tin my soldering iron and hold it in place here. And there we go, apply some solder. That didn't take. There we go, that's now secured nicely. So then the next thing we need to do is put the chassis back, or the motor bogey back in the chassis so we can connect this red wire to the wire that comes from the bogey at the other end. So here's the chassis, feed your red, red wire through the hole there. And just as you did to remove the motor bogey from the chassis, put it at an angle and then just give the chassis a little bit of manipulation to get it to clip back into place just like so so the last thing we need to do is connect these two wires and then that's ready to run on um, analog I think I need to strip or cut down this bit of, bit of wire here because it's far too long so I'm gonna just get a pair of wire cutters and cut a little bit off there so now with my wire strippers, I need to strip back these two wires so I can then twist them together and join them. So bring you my, I use wire strippers to do this. Um, you can use your craft knife against your thumb if you're so inclined to do so, you could do that. Be careful not to cut yourself. You can just pinch it between your teeth and give it a pull. Um, but I'm gonna use these wire strippers here just to strip back a nice length of wire there. I've got about two centimeters of bare wire that one and that one actually cut it a bit short let's try that again there we go got about two centimeters of bare wire now the heat shrink that comes with the uh, kit um it, you could probably get away with whoops that's my wire strippers hitting the deck you can get away with probably cutting that in half really so i'm just going to cut that heat shrink in half now really important thing to make sure you remember 
before you join these two wires, you must slide your heat shrink over one of the wires. Because if you join them, solder them, and then realize that you forgot to insulate that join, or you forgot to slide your heat shrink over, you're not gonna be able to insulate your join. You're gonna to have to undo the join and start this bit again. So slide that over and tuck it right out of the way. And then take the two stripped back bits of wire, pinch them together, and just twist the two bits of wire together like that. You see they're now twisted together. And then just to make sure that that creates a good circuit and doesn't come undone, I'm just gonna put a bit of solder up that twist and actually what I'm going to do now is just cut that down slightly so I don't really need that much bare wire there you go now I fold that join flat against one of the bits of wire and slide the heat shrink tubing over that join heat shrink tubing is it does what it says on the tin it shrinks when you apply heat so to shrink that tubing over that join so that it doesn't move and slide off i'm just going to use my soldering iron not to the end of the soldering iron because you don't want to get anything on the end of your soldering iron i'm just going to use down sort of the shaft of the soldering iron just gently rub over it top and bottom and both sides and you should begin to see that tube shrinks down onto that join there you go it won't shrink down completely to the size of the wire because that wire is very fine, but it will shrink enough that it won't move. There we go, it's a bit soft and squidgy now, but it will harden up again and that's that in place. So that's your motor installed and connected. So I can put the body back on, put the, uh, the weight back in first. Which way did you go? that way I'm going to tuck that wire just down that little gap there beside the weight so that it doesn't catch on the body when I put the body back on um, and to put the body back on as, as we said you've just got three holes on each side three clips on each side and just line up to make sure that is the right way around I don't actually think it makes a difference let's have a look no on this model it doesn't make a difference which way I put it because the middle hole is in the middle um, so I'm going to put that on top and then just press it down and that is on and the only thing I need to do at the end is put those buffers back in place which secure that body onto the model. Now one thing I didn't do and I'm just going to have a quick look at it is if I bring a little foam service cradle in have a look at, so we cleaned the wheels and the motor bogey here. I'll bring my light back over the top. We cleaned these wheels here, but we didn't really look at these wheels. To be fair, they don't look too bad, but I am going to give them just a little clean. Again, with your cleaning fluid of choice and a cotton bud, just rotate the wheel, give it a wipe. And this is the side I'm cleaning, is the side that picks up, is conducting onto the rail. However, I will clean both sides because as I said earlier, dirty wheels equals dirty track, dirty track equals dirty wheels. So if you keep your wheels all clean, it should mean that your track stays a bit cleaner. You can see from that cotton bud that that has taken some dirt and grime off. Right, so there we go. That's installed. What we're going to do now is put it on the test track and we'll give it a run. Okay, so here we are on the test track with this class 47. Uh, and I'm just going to turn the power up ever so slightly. There you see it starts off with a nice slow speed crawl. And that's often seen as one of the benefits of these CD motor upgrades is that you can get much smoother slow speed running than you can with the original motor you see there it maintains a nice slow speed crawl let's turn the power up a little bit
do that the other way. See that nice slow scroll there? It's much slower and smoother than you would have got on your original motor. There you go. So at that point, when it was running at top speed, that was only 40% on my controller. And that's one thing to mention about these motors. There are various different types. There's 12 volt motors, uh, and there are six volt motors of different shapes and sizes. This particular model has a slim six volt motor in because it has three axles on each bogey. So the motor needs to be slim enough to fit between the middle axle. There are some models such as your class 43 HST, where you've only got two axles per bogey and there's a big enough gap between the axles that you don't have to worry about the thickness of the motor and you can fit a wider motor in those models and there are various options in terms of voltages of motor for them however for these models and for steam models where the motor needs to fit between two of the wheels your only option is a slim motor and the only voltage that that comes in is six volt that simply means that the model will run faster on a 12 volt circuit. So you only need to apply half the power to get a decent running speed. And as I say, that was 40% power. Um, and on an analog circuit, that's the simplest way to make sure that these run well is just don't turn the juice up as high as you normally would. Of course, if you have a DCC decoder fitted, if you convert the model to DCC, and I have done another video in which one of these models gets converted to DCC, then that issue of running speed is dealt with because of course you can make adjustments to your decoder configuration values to make to, to limit the, the top speed and set the speed curve. Um, so thank you for watching. I hope that's been helpful. I hope that it's uh, an easy job for you to do uh, and I hope that it's a useful upgrade to your models and will keep them running for many years to come. Thank you.